Now, Jody. <laughs> Rotarians and guests, welcome to the June 9th meeting of the Rotary Club of York. Our members are dedicated to service above self and Rotary's four-way test. Leading us today in our opening song and pledge is Cal Weary and providing our invocation is Eric Chase. Cal. So I totally forgot what the song was today. Thank goodness they write it on there. It's one of my favorites. Rotarians, join me. My country, tis of the sweet land of liberty, of the I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountain side, let freedom ring. Now the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Will you please prepare yourself in a posture that you're accustomed to for prayer? Let us pray. Creator and sustainer of all that is or will ever be, we are thankful for this day that you have given us, for its blessings, its opportunities, and its challenges. May we appreciate and use each day that comes to us. We pray for strength and guidance for each day as it comes, for each day's duties, for each day's problems. May we be challenged to give our best always, and we, may we be assured of your presence with us. We request blessings on our speaker and the SPA's work for keeping our four-legged friends safe and healthy. We ask you to bless this food, the hands that prepared it and served it, so that we may continue to nourish our bodies to continue to serve you and our world through Rotary. For all this we pray, amen. Thank you, Cal and Eric, for that warm uh, opening. And Cal, it's wonderful to hear that your daughter, Ella, is improving so quickly. So um, our uh, best thoughts for healing and a rapid recovery for her. Uh, a reminder for our in-person audience to silence your cell phones. And also, we have some today. This is exciting. So Ryan Birkenhoff is a guest of Chad Myers. Uh, would you please stand when we say your name? Welcome, Ryan. We'll, we'll hold the claps till the end. We, I, know, I realize this is a shakedown meeting, but, and, and Ryan, if you could stand up. Well, I'm a little rusty too. I should have said, when I say your name, please stand and remain standing and then we'll uh, welcome you later. Jim Fowler is a guest of Kelly Gibson. Jordan Futrell and Michelle Futrell, student education. Delia Paban is a guest of Cal Weary and Sue Schmidt, a guest of past president, John Schmidt. Sue, if you would stand, please. All right. So please welcome Rotarians. Please help me welcome our guests. Thank you all. Okay, we have several announcements today. We heard from uh, Rotarian Bill Hartman last week about true Rotarians. So we are calling all true Rotarians. We have two fantastic opportunities for you. Number one, please complete and return your committee interest form for the coming year. And that should be submitted to the office by June 15th. Number two, your donations to the Rotary Foundation made by June 15th will earn double Paul Harris recognition points. Donations must be made by the 15th of this month and you can do them in three convenient ways. You can send a check to the Rotary um, office made out to the Rotary Foundation, or you can contact Lynn to be invoiced. Uh, this morning, I went online um, to our international website on the foundation, um, just did it very easy in a couple minutes for all of our virtual audience. You can do that. If you take a screenshot or email Melissa with uh, your amount at the, at the district, that will take care of it. So. Thanks for all who double your impact uh, from now till June 15th. 
development opportunities abound for us as Rotarians and those committed to service above self at both the district and the international level. Our district is offering a virtual development opportunity on Monday, June 14th at 6 p.m. Past District Governor Una Martone will lead a workshop on the color code. This is a world-renowned personality assessment that helps members of working teams understand how to best leverage one another's strengths. This understanding can help improve the success of any team in rotary boards of directors, committee, leadership teams, et cetera, and in your own professions. To register, you can visit the Rotary District website. Rotary International is providing a virtual convention June 12th to the 16th with innovative opportunities to learn and to engage with the world family of Rotary. You'll be able to network in virtual lounges, meet new partners in service and join fun activities with Rotarians from around the world. This event is open to all Rotary members. The fee is $65 and to register, visit rotary.org. <clears throat> now, as with any family, sorrows shared are halved and joys shared are doubled. So today we are sad to report um, we have two occasions, one for celebration, one for sympathy among our Rotary family. And we are sad to report the passing of Ann Hoover, wife of past district governor, Ben Hoover. Ann was actually an honorary member of our club since 2008. She last attended our centennial dinner dance celebration and is a Paul Harris fellow. Tomorrow, our board of directors will approve a resolution of respect for Ann, and that will be read at next week's meeting. Ben, we extend our sympathies to you and your entire family at the loss of your wife. We'd also like to um, share a joy and double that joy. And that is congratulations to Rotarian Jeff Hines for being named the 2021 recipient of the Business Achievement Award by the York County Economic Alliance. So congrats to you, Jeff. Um, now for an update and a poll from our IDEA committee as Chris Tuck. You're doing the update and Cal's doing the poll. You're doing update first. <laughs> Chris Top. <laughs> Thank you, President Dan. I'm glad that that's not how I conduct myself in everything I do in life, not knowing where I'm supposed to be and when I'm supposed to be there. Um, fellow Rotarians, back in October of 2020, uh, what started off as the DEI task force had its first meeting with a group that had high hopes of making swift and immediate changes that would not only improve the club, but have an overwhelming impact on the community that we serve. Admittedly, during those first few meetings, I was not exactly sure where things were going to end up going, but with some very frank, direct conversations, perhaps a couple of uncomfortable moments, and a lot of sharing about the topic at hand, along with a couple of, month of months of feeling things out, we've become a very focused and very passionate group. That being said, we put together a survey that was sent out to each member of the club on the topic of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Today, I plan on sharing what has been taken from our member responses, giving some explanation, in some cases, giving a re response uh, to some of the comments that had made multiple appearances, and giving an idea of what avenues of strategy we see our club going down to be better positioned as an organization that runs itself under the banner of service above self. One lesson that I've learned over the course of my broadcasting career uh, came through a ton of mistakes that I've made in building teams. In order to better serve, in my case, a television viewing area, there needs to be a fair representation of the viewing area with the team that I have in place in order to have access to all the different communities that make up the area that we serve. We're in a position to make positive corrections to our club right now. If we do not have a diverse membership, how can we purport to properly serve the community that we represent? More on that in a bit. Let's get to some of the survey results. Good, that worked. All right. First of all, I wanna thank the 134 members of our club that took the time to fill out the survey. 
There was a little bit of trepidation when we sent out the survey, wondering whether or not we would be warmly received or coolly received. And thankfully, as a club, you all proved that there was no need to worry. Your response is a great representation of our club's keen interest in building a more impactful future. I'm gonna avoid doing a deep dive on all of the numbers and percentages because in my experience of going through numerous budget meetings and talking about ratings with my news team, usually about the fourth or fifth data point, everybody gets that glazed look on their face and has no idea what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna be speaking to you in bullet points today. First thing I wanna share with you is that there were a number of questions where we seem to be in near universal agreement on the statements that were on the survey. As you'll see here, the statements I'm gonna put up here now are the ones where we had at least 80% agreement that the statement was true. First one is that our club encourages diversity. The second one is our club leadership supports the value of diversity and inclusion. We also see ourselves as a club being committed to diversity and the fact that we respect each other as members and value our differences. We're in, I, this one was, I think, the highest one out of all of them, uh, that a fair club in, includes a diverse membership with members from every age, race, gender, and ethnicity. Members appreciate diverse opinions. I believe the club will take appropriate action in response to incidents of discrimination. Members of different backgrounds interact well at this club. Members of different ages are equally valued at this club. This club provides an environment for the free and open expression of ideas, opinions, and beliefs. And then another one that had a very high, was just over 90%, is education about diversity will enhance this club. It's encouraging to see that we are overwhelmingly on the same page with a lot of things that we would likely agree are positive selling points about our club. Thing is, we have to look at the other side of the coin. There are some things that we are not as universally in agreement on, areas where we are not necessarily on the same page, and in some cases where that dip in agreement from the agreeing statements are really completely in contradiction with what we see in some of the other statements. So to give you an idea on those, what'd you do to me here? Ben, there we go. Now I gotta go back. Okay. Got me now. There we go. We had less agreement on the fact that on the first visit to the club, prospective members will experience cultural diversity. Our membership requirements encourage diversity in the club. Our club's recruiting process is focused on building a diverse club. It is easy for diverse people to become a member of this club. Every club member has access to leadership opportunities, regardless of age, race, gender, and ethnicity. My experience since joining this club has led me to become more understanding of racial and ethnic differences. Getting to know people with diverse backgrounds has been easy at this club. This club's policies and procedures encourage the elimination of discrimination. If I had a concern about harassment or discrimination in our club, I know how and where to report that concern. Leadership of this club demonstrates a commitment to meeting the needs of members with disabilities. And the final one, this club has done a good job providing programs that promote understanding diversity. Now, to be fair, all of these categories scored above 50% in the agreement standpoint, but most of them were between about 50 and 55, 56%. They don't align with the answers that we gave to the other questions. For example, to have very high scores on members of different backgrounds interact well and members appreciate diverse opinions as areas of near universal agreement, coupled with far lower scores on comments such as, on statements such as, our membership requirements encourage diversity in the club. My experience since joining this club has led me to become more understanding of racial and ethnic differences and getting to know people with diverse backgrounds has been easy at this club. Comparing these two sets of statements, where we are in universal agreement, I have a feeling is the club that we want to be a part of, that we hope to be a part of. When we look at the statements where we're not as much in universal agreement, I look at that as what our current reality is right now. 
In addition to looking at the disparities, in addition to looking at the disparities between similar sets of comments, the survey response also gave us a number that you see up on the screen here right now, 17%. 17% of the people that took the survey said that they have personally witnessed discrimination at our club. This number speaks on its own. I'm not, I don't believe that there's any need to go into all of the ways that this is unacceptable and a tremendous barrier to us becoming the club that we want to be. But sit on that number. Almost one in five of us has seen it at this club. So right now you might be sitting there going, hey, Chris, this is all well and good, but what are the next steps going forward? Well, the nice thing is I'm glad that you asked about that because I have an answer for you. The idea committee, formerly known as the DEI task force with ideas standing for inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, will take steps in the coming months to have discussions on the topic at hand. We understand that this is not something where we can switch a flip and, you know, presto, we have become the shining example of all things IDEA. We're looking to start the journey with conversations that will help us build the proper strategy and policies moving forward. How are we going to do that? For starters, we're going to look to meet with the committees that will have the most dramatic impact on the adjustments we are looking to make. Programming, membership, past presidents and nominating, and club foundation grants. In your own way, you can help too. Uh, reach out to these committees and join them. Or if you're a member of another committee, take part in the next year's planning cycle and make sure that you're taking the, the ideas and thoughts that we have here into account as you're making your plans. The idea committee is currently working on a plan to ask all willing members to join small group sessions. The hope is that from these smaller groups, we can develop more informed strategies that are based on our members' thoughts, ideas, and experiences. We do hope that a good number of you will choose to take part in shaping the future of our club. More details on that to come. Your input is very important. Before closing, there's one thing that as a committee we felt was important to address. There were several comments made in the survey about the club being just right the way it is and that the only reason that we are doing any of this is because of the events of the last year surrounding George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. To that, from a very, very heartfelt place, you're 100% correct. That is why we are doing this. Events happen that make us take a look at ourselves and change how we live and behave all the time. New laws come to life because of single events all the time as well. In 1994, a seven-year-old girl named Megan was raped and killed by somebody that was a sexual predator. We've changed laws since then. One event did make a difference that day. We become a better society when we react to right things that are not correct. Our goal here is to become a more relevant club, better serving the downtown York area we represent, and to follow the Rotary International's commitment to making our membership reflective of the community that we serve. There's a lot to read here, so be ready for this part. Rotary International's statement on DEI is as follows. As a global network that strives to build a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change, Rotary values diversity and celebrates the contributions of people of all backgrounds, regardless of their age, ethnicity, race, color, abilities, religion, socioeconomic status, culture, sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity. A top priority for Rotary is growing and diversifying our membership to make sure we reflect the communities we serve. We're creating an organization that is more open and inclusive, fair to all, builds goodwill, and benefits our communities. We want people with differing perspectives and ideas who will help Rotary take action to create lasting change in communities around the world. That's our, that's our Rotary International statement. At the end of the day, we're just trying to be much better at service above self. I'm gonna leave you with a few numbers here and a question. The city of York, the area that we serve, is 50.5% female, 58.4% black, I mean white, 26.6% black, 33.7% Hispanic or Latino. Take a look around the room here at the Country Club of York today, should you happen to be here live. 
or if you're in the Zoom gallery, take a look at all the people that are in that gallery with you today. Keeping those demographic numbers in mind that were just laid out, the question I ask you is, is our club a fair representation of those numbers? Help us progress and stay relevant in the world that is changing around us. We are good people, we do good things. Let's make sure that continues far into the future. Thank you for your time. If anybody has any questions at this point, feel free to ask. That's why I write for a long time, I cover it all. Sure. So what I would tell you is during our, oh, oh, are we doing things as far as an onboarding is concerned uh, to, to bring people in, make them feel more comfortable with Rotary from a, from a diversity side of things? What I will tell you right now is the, our, our committee right now, it took us six months to get the survey out and the results out. We've had a lot of conversations about things that we'd like to do. I will tell you that in those meetings, that has been discussed as something we'd like to do, but we're in the process now of trying to get feedback from everybody now to figure out what our best foot forward would be. I would agree that that would be a great way to do it though. Yes, Tom. Chris, if we could create one uh, KPI, key performance indicator, one numerical value that would sum up everything that you just said, where we're at now, so we, a year from now, we could look back and say, last year we were at 89 and now we've moved the needle. We've moved the needle. What would that number be? What, what grade, if you were giving us a numerical grade uh, instead of A, B, C, D, where would we, where would we put us at? What I would say right now, the question is, is, as far as a KPI number, where we are as a club now, where would we like to be a year from now or, or, or down the road? What I'll tell you with that is, in, in the discussions that we've had about it, I don't know that we have a number associated with anything. Um, the way that we look at it now, we don't have a lot of diverse people that are knocking down the door to become a member of our club. I think if a year from now, we have two people that add diversity to our club and they ask to be a part of the club instead of being recruited to be part of it, we've made progress. Uh, we've got to show progress within the community that we're in so that we're a desirable place and a desirable group to be a part of. I think that'll be the ultimate KPI is when we're, we're pushing back people from being members because we have too many. We can't have everybody introduced in the same week. Does anybody else have any questions? Chris, we have one question from online. Uh, this one's from <laughs> Lewis. Uh, he's, he asks, and you might have to go back to the stats, but he says, why do the white, black, and Hispanic numbers add to more than 100%? Ah, I knew there was going to be a mathematician in the group. Uh, this is, I have to deal with this with my finance and accounting people all the time. Uh, the reason why is because there are some people that identify with two different, two different races. And th those numbers are straight from the, the last census numbers. Those are straight from the Census Bureau. Thank you, Ken Cooper. Right. Is there anything else online, Ben? Does anybody else in the room have any questions? Nope. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And according to the agenda, Cal is now going to do a poll. <laughs> Hello, Rotarians. It's just so good to see everybody. I, I'm, I hate to be like taking it. I don't want to take it more time. So it takes all the way fast. Okay. So here is the poll for today. What do you believe is the origin of the Juneteenth holiday? A, Rosa Parks being arrested for disobeying an Alabama law requiring black passengers to relinquish seats to white passengers when the bus was full. B, the emancipation of enslaved people in the U.S. C, 
the landmark decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education civil rights case, or D, the date that the first Confederate statue was removed from the United States public space after the murder of George Floyd. Which one do you think it is? Oh, it doesn't come up there. That was really fast the way I read those. I really hope you guys had the answer already. How long do I wait? Yeah, we'll, we'll, give us. A, we'll give it a few more seconds here. We got about 62% of you have voted so far online. So A is Rosa Parks. B is Emancipation of Enslaved People. C is the landmark decision of Brown versus Board of Education, civil rights case. And D is the removal of Confederate statues after the murder of George Floyd. Well, it looks like about 72% of you, so about 40 of you have voted so far. There's about 53 people online right now that are joining. One of them is actually Bert Oberdick. Hello, Bert Oberdick. There we go. Yes. So what do you think? Someone, anyone? Right here. Oh, guys. Wow. Hey, you're pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> so right, so, so I'll, I'll just share real quickly the results online, and then, Cal, if you want to go ahead with the answer. But the majority of people have said, and this is 31 of you, have said the emancipation of enslaved people in the U.S. So 82% of you have said that. Um, second place, 11% is the, the day that the first Confederate statue was removed from the United States public space after the murder of George Floyd. That's 11%. If you want to just go ahead, Cal. So the answer is B, the emancipation of enslaved people in the U.S. And I'll give you something quick. I did not know about this until about seven years ago when I was asked to come and get an award during a Juneteenth uh, uh, experience in York. And they said, come on out for Juneteenth. And I'm like, what is that? So even me, a very learned human being in my own culture, did not know that that's what it was. So uh, we're all constantly still learning. We all have a place to. And I, I urge each and every one of you, go out and learn more about Ju Juneteenth. And hopefully you'll be a part of one of the wonderful celebrations that will be happening all over York, Lancaster, Harrisburg, and Gettysburg this year. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Cal, Chris, and Jen, and all the members of our IDEA committee. Now for our student education committee update is Diane Marino with Merit Scholarships. Hello. <laughs> On behalf of the Student Education Committee and our chair, Diane Marino, who is unfortunately not able to be here today, I'm very proud to welcome to the podium today the 2019 uh, James C. and Kerry B. Bush Scholarship recipient. His name is Juden Jordan Fortrell, and he's going to provide an update of his last year at Penn State. And Jordan is here with his mother, as you heard in the beginning when the introductions were made. His mother, Michelle, we welcome you here today. And of course, this scholarship is made possible from the York County Community Foundation uh, for the James C. and Kerry B. Bush Memorial Fund. And in addition, we're very pleased to be able to give to Jordan today the third $1,000 uh, scholarship uh, for his year coming up at Penn State. Jordan. I first wanted to thank you for the scholarship. Um, it's been instrumental in helping me take out fewer loans throughout my years of college. And it also has helped me give me the confidence to you know, achieve more uh, knowing that I had the support of the Rotary Club. So thank you so much for that. Um, this past year has been a challenging year for all of us, but uh, it's been really privileged to be able to serve as an EMT on campus, um, responding to 911 calls, which was taught me a lot. Um, I also was able to be a resident assistant in the dorms and help freshmen navigate um, their first year of college, as well as being able to serve on a career development team to help um, those interested in going to the medical career, uh, you know, have alumni panels with doctors and medical students that went to Penn State and help them prepare for a, a career in medicine. Um, you know, when I'm not at college, I serve as a medical technician at Spirit Trust Lutheran in Shrewsbury, which is a nursing facility. Um, been able to, you know, uh, help with activities of daily living there, as well as like passing medications, which has been great to be able to serve that population uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then this past few weeks, I've been able to participate in the Primary Care Scholars Program, which is offered through the Penn State College of Medicine. And through that program, I've been able to 
um, you know, hear more about different experiences uh, as being a physician, as well as looking how we can, um, you know, improve medicine in the coming years, which has been a great experience. Um, and I'm actually headed in two weeks back to Penn State to uh, do Alzheimer's research and a wet lab. So looking forward to doing that. Um, and the next semester should be a, you know, a good experience as I'll be a teaching assistant for the EMT class, helping to certify more EMTs as well as being a CPR instructor. And I just wanted to thank you again for uh, having me at this lunch and uh, giving me this scholarship. So thank you so much. Thank you, past district governor, Patty. And Jordan, congratulations to you on the scholarship award. And thank you so much for coming back to our club and sharing your amazing activities. Um, EMT on campus, a resident advisor in the dorms and career development, you are clearly engaged and you really epitomize um, the folks that are in the room that also give of themselves. So we welcome you to come back to our club at any time and we hope you consider um, joining Rotary in the future. So another round of applause please for George. And congratulations to you, Michelle. His mother. So now to introduce our speaker is past president Jody Keller. A dog walks into a job center. Wow, a talking dog, says the clerk. With your talent, I'm sure we can find you a gig in the circus. The dog says, the circus? What does a circus want with a plumber? Oh, come on, do you get it? He went in to apply as a plumber. Okay, never mind. Yeah, this is like not a good audience today. Anywho, cold room, cold room in more ways than one. Okay. It is my pleasure to introduce Stephen Martinez, the Executive Director for the York County Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, known as the SPCA. S Stephen oversees a passionate staff of 48 employees, an engaged group of nearly 420 volunteers, an operating budget of nearly $3 million and a 20,000 square foot building that houses over 85 dogs, and one plumber, 320 cats, 50 small animals, a veterinary wing, a high volume spay neuter clinic, and lots of animal enrichment, human service and educational programs. Since Stephen took over in the fall of 2019, which is like 14 dog years ago, his team significantly increased the York County's SPCA save rate by implementing their best practices transformation. To increase the York County SPCA save rate by over 24 percentage points in such a short frame, time, time frame indicates the leadership team has fundamentally rebuilt their entire internal operations to accomplish such a big feat. It has been a remarkable journey filled with interesting stories and lessons learned already. Stephen's wife is Allison, and he has six fur babies, three dogs, Chewy, Nora, and Leanna, and three cats, Ian, Daphne, and Clementine. It is my pleasure to introduce Stephen Martinez. All right, thank you, Jody. So this is Big Joe. <laughs> Big Joe was found stray wandering the streets of York. So somebody gave us a call and we went out and got Big Joe and we picked him up and brought him back to our facility. When he came in, he was severely underweight, he lacked muscle and he had a terrible limp in his left leg. Yet despite the pain, Big Joe was a gentle love bug who would lick you unexpectedly. Um, 
unfortunately, his, his pain was so bad that he wasn't able to play and he had really low energy. So my team and I, we did a full workup on Big Joe, which included a, which includes blood works and x-rays and various tests and vet exams. Uh, it turns out that um, Big Joe had an old fracture on top of his femur bone. So after the diagnosis, my team uh, got him to gain weight and muscle in that leg through various enrichment activities, but he, but he still had that terrible limp. So we decided to perform a more specialized orthopedic surgery on Big Joe um, to make him more comfortable and to, and, to, <laughs> and to prevent future complications. So the surgery went well. And afterwards, my team managed, managed his rehab, which included a bunch of physical therapy exercises like range of motion exercises and water therapy, where we would have him walk on a treadmill that was partially submerged in water. Of course, toys, food puzzles, and lots of affection was incorporated into his treatment. And this is Gilly. So Gilly was surrendered to the York County SPCA because his owner had passed away. Gilly started off as a loving, but a really, really timid cat. Um, when, when Gilly came to us, we quickly noticed that he had trouble urinating. So what was happening is that his urethra, which is basically the tube that brings the urine from the bladder out of the body, got very narrow at the end. Also in Gilly's case, he, um, he had crystals that were in his urine that were forming into bladder stones. Um, and so we put him on a special diet to keep those crystals from forming, but he kept having spasms of his urethra that was causing him to continuously reblock, which became a pretty, which became a life-threatening emergency for Gilly because he couldn't expel urine from his body. So we tried a bunch of different um, diet plans and medication, but nothing worked. He just kept getting reblocked. The only chance that Gilly had at survival was by us performing a pretty cutting edge surgery called perineal urethrosomy, which is sort of like replumbing Gilly from becoming a male cat to becoming a female cat by widening up that urethra to keep him from reblocking. Surgery went well, took about a month in vet wing to recover. And when he was able to leave and be handled by the animal care technicians, we noticed a remarkable and positive change in Gilly's temperament. He became a loving cat that was super bold and just ran all over the place. So we tried to get all the animals as healthy as possible before putting them up for adoption. Big Joe and Gilly's story really isn't that unique for our organization. We see thousands of animals come and go every year that need our help. What is unique is that we wouldn't have been able to perform the same level of, or provide the same level of care for Big Joe and Gilly prior to our best practices transformation. But because of the success of our, our transformation, we are now able to provide a very high level of medical care for all these sick and injured animals that come to our facility. To give you a sense of how impactful our best practices transformation was, I want to introduce you to the concept of save rate. So we track a lot of different metrics to um, establish values, to inform strategic decision making, to track progress. But the one overarching metric that we closely watch is called save rate. And the methodology behind save rate is pretty straightforward. It says, of all the animals that come in alive in a given year, how many remained alive? So in 2019, our average save rate was 64%. In 2020, we increased our average save rate to over 81%. So far this year, we are tracking about an 85% save rate and we're, we're on track to maintain that average. So we were able to increase our, our, our save rate by over 24 percentage points in just a year and a half, an accomplishment that the staff and volunteers are pretty proud of. And some people will say that the COVID-19 pandemic must have had something to do with it. And yes, our adoption rates did, um, did, did go up a little bit, but the delta in our adoption rates versus incoming animals only varied by single digit percentage points. Our save rate increased by over 24 percentage points. So in other words, it was the hard work of the staff and volunteers coupled with the best practices transformation that truly enabled our progress. So a save rate greater than 80% for an animal resource center like ours is considered very good. You have to remember that we're not just an animal rescue, that the type of mission critical work that, we, that an animal resource center like ours conducts extends way beyond just animal adoption. So for instance, we investigate and prosecute animal cruelty offenders. 
Last year, we pressed charges on over 165 cases of animal cruelty and neglect. Plus, we conducted over 600 animal welfare checks. So because we are responsible for enforcing animal cruelty for York County, and because we are the go-to facility for all of York County's stray animals, we take in a large number of animals that come from very bad conditions. Also, we are an open admission shelter, which means that we take in any kind of pet that needs refuge, no matter what breed or species, health condition or temperament, and we, we nurse those animals back to health so that we can put them up for adoption. So given the large volume of animals that we receive, um, an 85% save rate is pretty remarkable, but any, as I said before, anywhere in the 80% range is a more realistic goal for an animal resource center of our size and our scope. So, and, and Jody mentioned this, so when I tell you that we increased our save rate by over 24 percentage points in a short time frame, as she said, it lets you know that we fundamentally rebuilt our internal operations to accomplish that. And we were able to be successful during the middle of a pandemic. So before I dive into discussing what the best practices transformation is, I think it would be helpful to look at how and why we drifted down to that 64% uh, save rate. And, and that's by the way, Otto, our Humane Society police officer. So there were several contributing factors that led to our mission drift. I feel like I could, I could probably teach a workshop on how mission drift happens or how it happened to us. But as I reflected on the challenge, two ideas or themes kept recurring in most aspects of our operations, trust and transparency. We didn't trust the community and we were not transparent with our key stakeholders. So in the animal care world, we tend to see the worst of the worst when it comes to how people treat each other and their pets. And if you're not careful, it can negatively color your outlook, which can lead to seeing and thinking the worst in people. So gradually, I think the staff started to embrace a defensive posture and assume the worst in people or that people had bad intentions, which led to us developing a negative bias towards adopters. However, contrary to our negative bias, when I started to look at the data, our outlook did not match reality. So it turns out here in York County, fewer than 6% of pets end up at the York County SPCA, meaning that 94% 94 of households maintain a happy and healthy relationship with their pet. In other words, most people, at least 94%, are successful pet owners. Yet operationally, we treated everybody like they were the 6%, which is to say that we were skeptical of everyone. So gradually and almost unconsciously, we developed a process of requiring the public to prove to us that they were worthy enough to adopt one of our animals. And we asked people to jump through a million hoops before they could walk out the door with a pet. Because the adoption process was so tedious, potential adopters got frustrated and moved on and we began to develop a reputation for poor customer service. Um, we unnecessarily created barriers to adoption which ultimately reduced our adoption rates. Over the past year and a half, my team and I have been removing barriers to adoption. We now embrace a different philosophy of assuming that most people who want to adopt a pet have good intentions. So instead of harassing people with non-data driven barriers to adoption, we are instead educating and listening to people which has boosted our adoption rates. It's difficult to change company culture. It's difficult to get unstuck from a rut when you're in reactionary mode and are bogged down in the day-to-day, -day, it's easy to lose sight of or not prioritize your limited time uh, focusing on the most impactful tasks first. It wasn't that we didn't care or that we weren't smart. It was just a matter of not keeping up with best practices. We lacked a cohesive and strategic vision to help keep the leadership team focused and to guide priorities and organizational values. We devolved to the point where we needed to hit the reset button. We needed a clean slate to work from, we needed a plan, we needed a best practices transformation. So before my team and I developed a plan, the first thing we needed to do was establish trust among one another and introduce a lot more transparency at our organization. We needed to get a handle on our data, share our data internally with the leadership team, and then figure things out together. So step one in our transformational journey was focused mostly on creating space for everyone 
at all levels of the organization to feel comfortable enough to share their ideas. We started talking to one another in a pretty honest way. We sifted through uh, all our ideas and industry best practices and wove everything together into a strategy we ended up calling best practices transformation, which is essentially a culmination of everyone's best ideas, customized to work at our facility and our communities while tweaking and innovating everybody's ideas along the way. So essentially the best practices transformation focuses on a seemingly simple theme, get our house in order. The goal was to be excellent at doing the basics. If we could establish the solid foundation, then we could shift from reactionary mode and instead obtain the luxury of time and less stress, which enables us to think, to have fun, take risks, be creative. So the best practices transformation resulted in us rebuilding most of the organization, operationally speaking, and um, everything was new, change was a constant. So our transformation was initially built around was initially built around four major pillars of change. Um, you can see them there. It's uh, overhaul our entire information technology infrastructure, what we call our community cat initiative, which is managing the shelter's intake process, adopters welcome philosophy, and improving our internal and external communication. Be transparent. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna have time to go into all the details about what makes up most of the best practices transformation. I mean, again, I could probably, I, it's, that's a workshop worthy topic. Um, but I can, I do have time to share a few quick um, ideas or concepts that we've learned along the way. So the IT infrastructure upgrade is about giving the staff and leadership the tools that we need to make informed decisions and to carry out our ideas. We needed to get a handle on our data so that we could understand where we are, how we got here, and then be able to make strategic decisions about where we wanted to go and needed to go. So adopters welcome. Earlier when I, earlier when I spoke about improving our customer service and removing barriers to adoption, that is essentially what went into our adopters welcome effort. We take excellent care of the animals, but no matter how good we are at our job, an animal will always be happier on your couch than in our facility because it's just less stressful. But that concept is difficult for many animal rescue professionals to accept and the paradigm shift that occurred at our organization that allowed us to increase our save rates so dramatically was just by accepting that fact. By shifting our perspective towards adopters to a more positive and trusting point of view changed everything. So because I think ideas around trust and culture change are so interesting and had such a positive impactful um, impact at our organization, I wanted to give you all just one more example of how we shifted the culture to a more trusting perspective. So when a person would, would show up to surrender a pet to our facility, we would accept that animal into our custody, no questions asked. We didn't ask questions because we assumed that if you wanted to surrender your pet to us, you must be a bad person and that that pet is better off with us than with you. We judged people without seeking an understanding of the circumstances that led a person to the difficult decision of surrender. So a big culture change that we started to embrace was this was the following mantra, that surrendering a pet to the York County SPCA should be a measure of last resort. Our goal became connecting pet owners to as many resources as possible to help support a happy and healthy pet ownership experience. We started talking to people and asking questions. When we started to ask questions and then we listened, we learned that in some situations we could prevent a person from surrendering their pet by connecting them to one of our human service programs. So you might be surprised to learn that we not only offer animal services, but human services too. So I think of our human services as preventative resources that keep people and pets together and those pets out of the shelter. So for example, a common reason why a person would surrender a pet to us is because their pet needed some sort of life-saving emergency that they couldn't afford to have done. And then rather than see their pet suffer, they would surrender their pet to us, knowing that we will provide that life-saving surgery. So it's heartbreaking to think that people are being separated from their furry family member because of income constraints. 
So the Karma program is one of our donor supported human service programs that allows us to provide free or affordable life-saving vet care for pets that are coming from low income households. So in other words, by connecting people to resources like our Karma program, we kept people and pets together and those pets from ending up in the shelter. My battery's dying. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so if you don't give people your truth, they will invent it themselves. You may know that. So by failing to prioritize our internal and external communication, we suffered a complete dis disconnect, both internally among ourselves and externally among our key stakeholders, which resulted in complete ambivalence. We struggled to engage our audience because we were not transparent with our communication with them, which resulted in a rise in apathy and a decrease in trust. So to improve our communication among key stakeholders, we had to improve our transparency. Again, you know, I could teach a workshop on the value of improving internal and external communication and how we manage to communicate more effectively, but our time together is short. However, I, I do wanna share a few of the ideas that we've learned. So, um, we go. it can be more difficult than you might think to become a more transparent organization because it puts the organization and specifically the executive director, the CEO, in a very vulnerable position. It's risky and therefore scary to be transparent. My job is to manage risk for our organization. So you have this dichotomy of exposing the organization to risk versus doing what you think is the right thing by letting your key stakeholders and the community know how they should hold you accountable. So one of the first steps that we took to becoming a more transparent organization was to establish and share our metrics for success with the staff and with the board of directors. So we needed to be honest about our strengths and our weaknesses, and we needed to educate key stakeholders about how we were gonna measure our progress. Ultimately, being more transparent with our key stakeholders cultivated this sense that we're all in it together. And then everybody felt connected to improving our organization together, we had skin in the game. So you can see here that we, um, we publish our data right on the homepage of our website now. Another step we took was to encourage, was to engage our community in more sincere and meaningful ways. We started to put out regular value-driven content. We have a, a blog that we keep up with, an e-newsletter, lots of channels of communication now. So we started to communicate with the media more frequently. We're at a place now with the media that they check in with us prior to running a story about anything to do with animal welfare uh, because they see us as a credible and trusted resource. And quite honestly, we make their jobs a lot easier by being ready with um, good data points and sound bites that work well for tight deadlines and a short audience attention span. So we used to have a, uh, we used to have a pretty hostile relationship with social media. Uh, but when we started to leverage the power of storytelling in our social media platforms, we began to develop a following of devoted fans. Now, when somebody posts an untrue or inflammatory comment on social media, which happens all the time, uh, our followers will passionately come to our defense and correct the record for us so that we don't have to, which gets us out of that defensive posture, a place you don't want to be as a communication best practice. In terms of our external communication, our mantra is no data without story, no story without data. People don't care how, yeah, yeah. So from my point of view, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Facts don't work. If they did, we would exercise regularly. So therefore, another communication tool that we've leaned into is the power of storytelling. Um, so the power of storytelling coupled with great photography and video, you've seen all these pictures are our pictures. Video in particular, I believe is a powerfully persuasive tool. And if you package it in a storytelling framework, your ideas can be downright unstoppable. I mean, think about it. The unbelievable, which we deal with every day, only becomes believable after you can see it. And we no longer buy into the BS that our issue isn't personal. If it's, it's important, so it's personal. And that's how we approach our, approach our advocacy work as well. 
Oh, that was the video example. So it's these concepts and others that have allowed us to achieve many of the initiatives within the best practices transformation. But make no mistake, our story is not a success story. Um, our story is we're still on the path and life's a journey kind of a story. Okay, so did you know that, um, that a cat, that a female cat can have three litters of, kit, of three litters of kittens per year on average and four kittens per litter on average. So a female cat can reproduce basically throughout her lifetime. So, in a, so a, a free roaming unowned community cat can live for 12 to 15 years on average. So that means that one female cat could possibly have 145 to 180 kittens in her lifetime. In 2020, we spayed more than 2,900 female cats. So imagine how out of control the free roaming cat population would be if we didn't have an aggressive spay neuter program. Last year, we spayed and neutered over 8,000 animals. And this year, we're gonna do well over 9,000 animals. Plus we vaccinate all those animals for zoonotic diseases like rabies and distemper, which can transfer from pet to human and is deadly to humans. So imagine what our communities would look like if the York County SPCA were to disappear tomorrow. So what I'm trying to say is that we are a nonprofit mission-driven organization that seeks to improve all communities within York County by fostering a happy and healthy relationship between people and their pets. We do this by finding loving permanent homes for stray and displaced animals. We investigate and prosecute animal cruelty offenders. We educate the general public about animal wellness and safety and we control the pet population growth rates through an aggressive spay neuter program. So we are York County's Animal Resource Center and we exist because of the love and support of our community, our volunteers, our donors, our elected officials, adopters, and many others. So thank you to all, to all our supporters out there for being there for us and rest assured that we will continue to be there for all of York County's pets. Um, and do I, do you want me to take some questions? Okay. So does anybody, anything you want to know about the York County SPCA? Yes. They were adopted this week. They are, they're on my mind this week because they were adopted. So that's why I put them in there. Yep. Did you want one? Do you want Big Joe? Because I got another dog that you would like. <laughs> yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so we're not a breed specific organization. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, what determines what kind of animals are we going to keep in our facility versus send an animal to a different organization? Is that about right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we are a breed specific. Um, we're not a breed specific organization. So any animal that's given to us, we will, for the most part, keep it and then adopt it out. However, if an animal comes in with a specific challenge or issue that somebody else has more of an expertise to address, then we will um, then we'll sometimes like transfer that animal to that organization. But as an open admission shelter, as I said before, we take in any kind of uh, animal, no matter what breed or species, health condition or temperament. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I, I would guess it had some sort of specific issue that, that have, they had a particular expertise on that we sent them to. Yes. So re-entry meaning return back to the shelter. So the question was, is do we track a re-entry rate? And what you mean is, so our, our language that we would use is return to shelter. So, so if an animal has been adopted out and then is returned back to us, we do track that metric. The big question I get, I think I know where you might be going with that, is everybody's concerned. So everybody knows that adoption rates spiked last year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so one of the like, um, kind of rumors that have been going around even at a national level is everybody's concerned about those pets that were adopted being returned back to shelter when people go back to work, right? And so we've done a lot of media coverage on this and the data at our local level here and at a national, national level are indicating that people are not returning their pets due to, 
the pets that were adopted during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is good. That's a good news. And the reason why is because, and this will be my last question, is because um, my, my opinion is because p the pandemic lasted forever, 14, 15 months. So people had time to manage that transition of the animal into their lifestyle, into their household. And so they aren't gonna return their pet because they've had the time to have a successful transition. Um, so I think that's part of the reason why. I think shelters will see an increase in intake, animal intake, but not because of returning pets due to the pandemic, we're just going back to normal. We're regressing back to the mean. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, Stephen. Thank you for a great job um, leading our York County SPCA and thank you for an excellent presentation. Very proud that you're a partner agency of the United Way of York County. And in honor of your visit with us today, we have a book and there's a book plate over there for you to sign that we will donate to another uh, partner agency. And that will go to the YWCA in Hanover to their child care center. It's the story of Mr. Rogers and his neighborhood. Our club meeting next week will feature a program by Tiffany Seitz, Miss Pennsylvania. Our closing song today, you, I'd like you to um, invite and in, don't put it up yet, Ben, and guessing the artist. Today's artist has composed over 3,000 songs and is in a select group to have it, uh, received at least one nomination from the Academy Awards, Grammy Awards, Tony Awards, and Emmy Awards. Any guesses? No, did you see it? Are you see? You're good, Jody. Dolly Parton. How did you know? As an actress, you get a free cake there. Boston cream pie for Jody, her favorite. Dolly Parton um, starred in films such as Nine to Five, 1980, uh, the Best Little Horror House in Texas, 82. She earned a Golden Globe nominations for those, as well as Rhinestone in 84, Steel Magnolias in 89. Straight Talk in 92 and Joyful News in 2012. So this is her hit, Jolene. Hope you enjoy. Have a great week, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Ben.